verse number 12, where Jesus is speaking and he says these words, And behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me, to give every man according as his work shall be. The title of the sermon this morning is The Rewards of a Christian. The Rewards of a Christian. Sunday evening, I preached on the topic of the chastisement of a Christian, the discipline of of a Christian from his father, from God, of course. Now, that subject dealt mainly with the, a disobedient Christian. Tonight, we're going to talk about, or this morning, we're going to talk about the opposite. We're going to talk about the rewards of an obedient Christian. I want these two sermons coupled together in your mind to provoke you unto good works, to provoke you not to live a sinful life because you'll be chastised. But not only that, if you do not live a sinful life, but rather you live a life that is pleasing in God's sight, a righteous life, God will reward you. And this is meant to be an incentive. Here we see in verse number 12, Jesus says, speaking unto the churches, speaking unto Christians, and behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me. Why would Jesus say that? Because he wants to tell you that there's an incentive. I'm coming and I'm going to reward you. And he tells you right after that to give every man according to as his work shall be. So we can see when we read that it's meant to compel you to be a good Christian. It's meant to compel you to do that which is right and to live a holy and just life so you can be rewarded when Jesus comes back. I want you to turn to John chapter number 4. John chapter number 4. <clears throat> of course we know that salvation is free. You do not work for salvation at all. If you work for your salvation... You're not going to make it to heaven. Sadly, unfortunately, you're going to go to hell. The Bible teaches in Romans chapter number 4, verse number 4, that if you work, you will receive a reward for salvation. But it's not something good. It's not salvation itself. It is debt. It says, now to him that worketh, this is a man working for his salvation. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. And that, of course, is the punishment, with it, which is debt. It says in verse 5, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. That's what a reward is. is, it is it's someone being recompensed for a work that they had done. So if you try to work your way to heaven, you will be rewarded. And re being rewarded, a reward in and of itself is not always a good thing. You know, In this case, the reward is debt. A reward is just, I'm going to give you what you deserve for what you have done, right? So if you work for your salvation, if you try to get yourself to heaven based upon your own works, you're going to be disqualified. God will reward you, but it will not be a good reward. Now, to be saved, it's just by putting your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, Titus 3, 5, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. And just like I read in Romans 4, 5, it says, but to him that worketh not. But believeth on him that justified the ungodly. His faith is counted for righteousness. So, doing no work at all, no work at all, but believing in the Lord Jesus Christ, that's the ticket into heaven. That's the recipe that a person has to you know, walk by. That's what they have to do is just believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's all that they have to do, and then they're saved. That's it, nothing else. They're saved forever, and it's eternal. But after that, after that, you should be a good person. You don't have to be a good person to stay saved. You know, once you're saved, you're always saved. It's a done deal at the moment that you put your faith in Christ. It's over. But you should be a good person. One of, the, one of the things that should compel you are the rewards that God offers. Look there in John chapter 4. First, while we're here in John 4, look over just another bolstering scripture that salvation is free. It's easy. It's just, and, it's, and it's eternal. Look at verse 14 when Jesus is speaking to the Samaritan woman. It says, but whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. So notice it's a one-time thing. It's a one-time event when you get saved. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. All you have to do is just drink of the water. All you have to do is just receive Christ as Savior. Once you receive him, you'll never thirst again. You'll be saved. You'll never have to worry about that ever again. I want you to turn over to John. In John chapter 4, I have to turn my page at least where the verses are located. I want you to look at verse number 34. The Bible says, Jesus speaking, Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me, and to finish his work. Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes, 
eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. Look at verse 36. And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. I want you to notice here, he's speaking about a saved person. First, he, you see him when he's presenting the gospel to the Samaritan woman. He explains very clearly that it's just free. All you have to do is just take of the water. Once you have it, you have it forever. You'll never be thirsty again. Once you're saved, it's eternal life. You can never lose your salvation. It doesn't matter how bad you are. There's not a limit. Oh, what if I do? It doesn't matter. It's not, there's, there's nothing you can do. You're saved forever. But once you are saved, you should work. You should do works. You should do things that will please God. And you know what? Because God is just, God will then pay you for the works that you do. And I want you to notice here that it's actually referred to as wages. It is a payment. So if you do works, you will receive a reward or you will receive wages. And it is also meant here in John chapter number 4 to be uh, an incentive again. That's why I want to point that out again. It's meant to be an incentive. He says, and he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal. I want you to notice that how Jesus both times when he says this, it's meant to compel you to do good works because you can receive wages. You can receive rewards. You can receive things in heaven. I want you to turn over to, flip over in your Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. 1 Corinthians chapter number 3. It should encourage you or provoke you unto good works. The fact that the fact that you will be recompensed justly for the work that you've done. Matthew chapter number 6 verse number 19 says, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. Verse 20, listen to this. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. Now, how do we lay up for ourselves treasures in heaven? By doing works. Right? That's the way that we receive wages. So what is, what is Jesus saying? He's saying do works so that you can lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. There's nothing wrong with wanting to do, you know, wanting to keep God's law and wanting to do good works so that you can receive treasures in heaven. On the contrary, Jesus actually said lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. You know, there's nothing wrong with working for God so that you can earn a reward. Of course, we should work for God and we should keep his commandments because we love him. Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. But at the very least, if you don't have the right or perfect love for God in your heart, and that's not the reason why you're keeping God's commandments, even if it is just to be rewarded, that's better than not keeping God's commandments at all. That's better than just doing whatever you want in your life, and then you're going to be chastised and you're going to live a miserable life in that sense. But there's nothing wrong with, with being given incentives or even being compelled by the incentive. That's the whole reason why Jesus said, Behold, I come quickly, and my reward is with me. Once you look here in 1 Corinthians chapter number 3, look at verse number 6. We'll see this spoken of about the reward. Verse number 6, he says, I have planted, this is Paul speaking, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. So there again we see the, the reward being spoken of, and it says according to his own labor. Of course we're talking about soul winning, getting people saved. Look at verse 9. For we are laborers together with God. Ye are God's husbandry. Ye are God's building. According to the grace of God which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another buildeth thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereupon. For, for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid which is Jesus Christ. Now watch this. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare. Obviously speaking of judgment one day. Because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work 
shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Now, you know, you have the Catholic teaching of purgatory, just to point this out real quick, and then you have this idiot Doka and LeBlanc who have been teaching that, yeah, you're going to be tried by fire for just a short period of time, but it doesn't say you're going to be tried by fire. That's what people misread right here. It says your works will be tried by fire. I want you to look at this one more time. Look up at verse number um, verse number 13. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. That It's trying the gold, silver, precious stones, and then the wood, hay, and stubble. And the point is, if you set your works out in front of God, God's going to burn them up, and the only thing that's going to last are the gold, the silver, and the precious stones, because that can they, that there can withstand uh, fire. That withstands fire, but the wood hand stubble will be burned up and it's gone. You're not wood hand stubble. You're not gold precious stuff. You understand what I'm saying? It's not talking about you yourself. That's why it says, yet so as by fire, because your works are burned up. You're saved. And it even clearly tells you in verse number 15, if any man's work shall be burned. If any man's work shall be burned, saying you have nothing left. He shall suffer loss like he's going to lose things. He's going to lose rewards. But then look what it says next. But he himself shall be saved. From what? From fire. From you know, That's exactly what it's speaking. You're not going to be burned by the fire. That's right. what it's talking about. Right. Right. Yet so as, it, it even says right after that, just to clarify, what do you say from? Yet so as by fire. That's what it's talking about. So, but I want you to notice here how this is meant to be an incentive. Over and over again, it's meant to be an incentive to earn rewards. It's meant to be an incentive to have uh, you know, gold. Precious stones, silver, things like that. Just like Jesus said, hey, don't lay up treasures on earth. Lay up treasures in heaven. There's nothing wrong with wanting to earn rewards. On the contrary, God repeatedly tries to provoke you to earn rewards. One of the main points that I want to make, my first point, really it's going to be overall throughout this whole sermon, I'm going to reference this repeatedly, is that the primary source of your rewards is going to be from soul winning. The primary source of your rewards are going to be from soul winning. And repeatedly, when the Bible talks about someone receiving rewards that they're going to earn in heaven, almost always it's talking about people that they had gotten saved. Go back to John chapter number 4. What's it talking about? He that reapeth receiveth wages. What's that? Gathered fruit of the life eternal. Say, so, you know, Jesus tells them, lift up your eyes and look, for the fields are white already in the harvest. He's talking about the people coming and to preach the gospel to them. What's the context of 1 Corinthians chapter number 3? What's it speaking about here? It's talking about, he said, I, well, I planted a polished water, God gave the increase. Then he starts talking about how we're all working together. Doing what? What's the context? Getting people saved. Talk about planting seeds, going out preaching the gospel. So you know what? Over and over again, when you look up rewards, how can I earn rewards? You ask the question, okay, it's an incentive, but what do I do to earn rewards in heaven? If I want to get to heaven and have a lot of rewards put before me... You know what the Bible normally it speaks of when it speaks of rewards? Soul winning. Getting Amen. people saved. Going out and preaching the gospel to people. You know why? Because God, you know, God is going is more likely to reward you for things that he cares about. God, the very last words before Jesus ascended into heaven, you know, he, he, he gives the great commission. He tells people to go forth and preach the gospel, right? Why would that be his last words? Because that's what's important. So doesn't it make more sense that the most important thing to him, that's what he's going to give you the most rewards for. That's what he's going to reward you for the most. Repeatedly, when you look throughout the Bible, when the Bible speaks about rewards, it's almost always talking about soul winning. Almost always speaking about receiving wages and things along those lines. I want you to go to, uh, flip over to 1 Corinthians 9. Go, go over to 1 Corinthians 9 and we'll see this again. Here's an Old Testament passage Speaking about receiving rewards, Ruth chapter number 2, verse number 12. The Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. That's, of course, Boaz speaking unto Ruth. Boaz speaking unto Ruth. And so 1 Corinthians 3, where we're at there, we also see that that bolstered eternal security. So even if you do have wood, hay, and stubble, your works will be burned, but you're saved. You're still saved, yet so as by fire. 
That's why I said in the very beginning of my sermon Sunday evening how that this particular doctrine, and these are really, uh, you know, the same coin but two different sides of it. One is the chastisement of a disobedient Christian. One is the reward of an obedient Christian. So it just is God's treatment of a Christian based upon whether he lives a good life or a bad life. And you know what this doctrine does, Whether you want, even if you want to split them into two separate subjects. If you want to talk about a disobedient Christian receiving punishments, an obedient Christian receiving rewards, it bolsters eternal security. It bolsters the gospel, and, and it supports and strengthens the teaching of the gospel. You know, a lot of people don't preach the doctrine of being rewarded for the good deeds that you do and then being punished for the bad deeds that you do. You don't hear that preached a lot, that if you live a sinful life, God's going to punish you. You know, if you live a good life, you'll be rewarded in heaven. You don't hear people preach about that too often. <clears throat> You're in 1 Corinthians chapter number 9. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 9. Look at verse number 16. Paul speaking. For though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory of. For necessity is laid upon me. Yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. So clearly the subject is preaching the gospel. Verse 17. For if I do this thing willingly... I have a reward, but if, against, but if against my will a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me, what is my reward then? Verily that when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ. That I might gain them that are without law. To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Verse 23. And this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. And then he says in verse 24. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. Notice this is meant to be an, an, an incentive. He says... Only one person is going to be rewarded when people race, right? And then he tells them, so just like that, when there's a race and there's only one winner and only one guy receives the prize, run with the same mindset. Run thinking only one person receives the prize. Only one guy is going to be rewarded. Look at what it says after that. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. It's tempered in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. Look at this. But we am incorruptible. So what does Paul say that he's doing? Why is he running the race? To obtain an incorruptible crown. You know, one of the reasons why Paul did all the things that he did, and he went out and he strove, and he was striving for masteries, and he worked hard, and he went out soul winning, he's not sleeping. He's being persecuted, all of these different things. He went through that so that he could one day be rewarded by God. That's one of the main reasons he talks about here of why that he did this. When he's speaking about, hey, strive for mastery. He says, yeah, they do it. When, when people are out there competing, they do it so that they can obtain a corruptible crown. He says, but you know the reason why I do it, why we do it? So that we can obtain an incorruptible crown. It's a good thing to strive in order to be rewarded. You should care what God thinks about you. Right. You should care that when you stand before God, whether he's going to say, you're not getting a crown. Or whether he's going to give you a crown. That's, that goes hand in hand. Loving God, caring about you know, what he thinks about you and all of these things, and being rewarded, they go hand in hand. Because I want to stand before God, and I want him, because he's the judge. I want him to be pleased with what I've done on earth. I want him to be happy with the work that I've done. And I want him to reward me because I care about his opinion. Because I love God and I love who he is. Right. Look at what it says that in verse number 26, verse number 27, speaking about being disciplined. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air. But I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, saying he's, he's disciplined. Lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Now here in 1 Corinthians 9, again, what is he talking about? What's he talking about in the context of being rewarded? Preaching the gospel. 
That's what he started the whole conversation out with. So the primary source, your main channel of rewards, where you're going to receive the majority of your rewards when you get to heaven and God you know, uh, rewards you for things, it's going to be for preaching the gospel. That's just, if we look at verses, you know, it's not a matter of opinion. Let's lay all the verses out. Let's do a word search on reward. The majority of the time when it's speaking about being rewarded of God, it's speaking about going soul winning. And isn't that a sad thought to think that the majority of Baptist churches today are doing zero soul winning? They're not preaching. You're going to have probably millions of Christians in heaven with no crown. There are going to be millions of Christians standing in heaven that, are, that have zero rewards. And if they do it, very little rewards. If the primary source of your rewards is preaching the gospel and you've never got a person saved in your entire life, you're not going to have that many rewards when you get to heaven. You say, I want to be rewarded greatly. Then go preach the gospel. Then go get people saved. Then go out and get a burden for people. And that will even compel you more so. Have multiple burdens. Have multiple things that are compel compelling you. Understand that there's a real hell and people are going there and care for people. Maybe that would compel you. Love God, and that will compel you to go preach the gospel. If you love God and you care what he thinks about you, hey, and guess what? On top of that, you'll be rewarded. God will give you a crown. God said, Jesus said, lay up treasures in heaven. You should care what God thinks. Hey, but there's nothing wrong with wanting to be rewarded. You should strive for a crown. You should strive for the mastery. I want you to turn to 2 John 8. Second John. Actually, I'm sorry. Go to uh, Second Timothy first. Second Timothy chapter number four. There's a few times where the crowns mentioned. We're going to go through these few passages pretty quickly here. I just want you to see this. But there are different crowns that are talked about for different things that someone may do to receive a crown, for different deeds that a person does, different achievements. Look at Second uh, Timothy chapter number four. Once you look at verse number six. Uh, so, uh, G, uh, Paul speaking, he says, For I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought a good fight, I have finished my course, I have kept the faith. Henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. So notice here, Paul says that he has personally for him laid up a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me at that day. And not to me only. So there are other people that are going to receive this crown, and look what you have to do. But unto all them also that love his appearing. So if a person is waiting for Jesus to come back and they love Christ's appearing, they, they, you know, they don't fall in love with the world and the things here. And they just want, oh, I just want a little bit more time so that I can enjoy this or I can enjoy that. But rather they're looking, they can't wait. Like Paul says, you know, I, you know, I'm in a straight betwixt two, having a desire to depart to be with Christ. But the only reason I want to stay is so that I can benefit and help the church. That's someone that loves his appearing. They can't wait to see Jesus. They can't wait to dwell and to be with Jesus. There's going to be a special crown, a crown of righteousness, he says, that's going to be rewarded or given to Christians that spent their life. And when they die, they finish their course just desiring to see the face of Jesus Christ, just waiting for the time in which they could finally lay their eyes on Jesus. There's going to be a special crown for those people. And if you fall in love with the things of this world, and if you care more about this life, your, your family even, than you do Jesus, then you're not going to be rewarded that crown. If you don't love his appearing, if you just you know, can't wait for his appearing, then you're not going to be rewarded that crown. I want you to look at another crown with me. Go to James chapter number 1. So there's a crown given to those that love his appearing. But also here in James chapter number 1, it talks about a completely different crown, a totally different uh, reward, a crown as a reward. Look at James 1, look at verse 12. Blessed is the man that endureth temptation. For when he is tried, that's like tempted, he shall receive the crown of life, which the Lord hath promised to them that love him. So notice that. So he tells you that there's a, a specific type of person, a person that endures tribulation or that endures temptation. It says when he's tried, and if you endure that temptation, it says that you will receive the crown of life. So there's a crown of righteousness for the people that love his appearing, but then there's a crown here of life for those that when you are tried in your life and you're able to endure that temptation. Like Job, for example. Job is mentioned in this book in chapter number 5 at the end for a good example of those that endured uh, tribulation or endured temptation. You will receive the crown of life. 
If you're tried in your life and you make it through that trial, you make it through that temptation, one day God will reward you with a crown of life. I want you to turn to 1 Peter chapter number 1. Look at another crown here. I'm sorry, 1 Peter chapter number 5. 1 Peter chapter number 5. The last chapter, not the first chapter. 1 Peter chapter number 5, but it's verse number 1. Very beginning of chapter number 5. The Bible says, The elders which are among you, I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. So he's speaking on a passage here. The proof of that verse 2. That's what elder means here in this context. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly. Not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind. And then he says, verse 3, Neither is being lords over God's heritage, but being in samples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd, that's Jesus, of course, shall appear, ye shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. So we saw the crown of life for those that endure temptation. We saw the crown of righteousness for those that love is appearing. And right here, speaking, it says unto bishops, or probably, I don't know this for a fact, but anyone in authority, those that are over people and they're giving a good example to those that are under them, he says that they will receive a crown of glory, he says, that fades not away. Isn't that the same thing that Jesus said when he talked about lay up your treasures in heaven? What does he say? Where moth and rust doth not corrupt. So this crown, if you think about this, this crown that's given unto them will never fade away. From the day that you're given it, for a million, two million, three million years, it's still going to look exactly the same. It's going to shine just as much as the day that Jesus put it on your head as it will five billion years later. Think about that. It will not diminish at all, period. It's the same thing that uh, Paul said. You know, they, those people that strive for masteries, they strive for a corruptible crown. It's going to rust. You know, it's going to, you know, moth can eat up clothing and things like that, different rewards that you may be given in life. If you receive some sort of sash or whatever it may be. But this, these rewards, they're going to last forever. Nothing's ever going to happen to them. They're going to be just as great and as magnificent, you know, many years later as the day that Jesus Christ gave it to you at the judgment day. Amen. <clears throat> so we see here that there is a crown of glory. For the elders that, that take you know, the oversight thereof, but not with constraint. I want you to go to 2 John chapter number 8. Now, this is something that I've actually never heard preached, what I'm about to preach to you now. So I want you to go to 2 John uh, verse 8. I've spoken to a lot of people that, that believe this, but I've never heard it. someone stand up behind the pulpit and actually preach it to a congregation as a warning. I want to read to you from, uh, from Matthew chapter number 5, verse number 19. And the point of this is that I want you to understand that there are different statuses in heaven. There are certain people receiving crowns. There are certain people not receiving crowns. There are people that are striving for the mastery and obtaining the prize. There's people that are striving, that aren't striving for the mastery and they're not obtaining the prize. There are people that get the crown of righteousness, people that don't. People that get the crown of glory, people that don't. Keep people that get the crown of life, people that don't. Heaven is not, you know, some communist, you know, country. It's, it's not some u utopia that people are dreaming of, of, of socialism. There are different statuses in heaven. There are different rankings in heaven. Matthew 5, 19, Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. I want you to notice that there are people that are great in the kingdom of heaven, and then there, are, there, there will be someone... Uh, you know, unfortunately, that will be considered the least in the kingdom of heaven. But guess what? He's in the kingdom of heaven. There's the least and there's the greatest. They're not the same. There's going to be people that have rewards, people that don't have rewards. Everything's not the same in heaven. So that's a, a, an incentive to finish your course, to finish the race. <clears throat> that's what we're going to talk about specifically right now here in 2 second, second John. Why don't you look at verse number 8. <clears throat> Finishing the course, he says this, Look to yourselves. That we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. I want you to notice what he says in verse number 8 in the very beginning. He says, look to yourselves. Like, kind of like examine yourselves. He's telling them to be diligent. You've, you've worked hard up to this point, but make sure you look to yourselves. And he says this, that we lose not those things which we have wrought. Now, what's, what is the inference there, the implication? He's saying we've wrought for things... Right? 
And as of right now, I'm going to receive these rewards. But you can lose these particular rewards. That's why it says right after that, that we receive a full reward. Notice the, 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 the word you know, lose there. I've never heard a person stand up behind the ball, but I've never even heard someone teach that, hey, you, you, you need to strive for your rewards, but guess what? You need to make sure that you finish the course. You need to make sure that you finish the race. All the work that you've done, you need to look to yourselves that you don't lose the things that you've wrought. You know, you can be an amazing Christian in your early years, and then just be a lazy, deadbeat that never goes to church, never goes soul winning, and not finish your course, and still get to heaven and have nothing. Think about that. You could, you could be a great Christian in your 20s and in your 30s. You could be, you know, the most faithful member here serving, asking to do things at the church, going soul winning every week, running soul winning times, just doing everything you could possibly do. And in heaven, if you were to have died at that moment, God had a special place for you where he had all kinds of crowns, all different types of things for you that he was going to reward you with. But then after that, you backslid. You stopped going to church. You stopped reading your Bible. You stopped going soul winning. You stopped having a passion for getting people saved. And then God just took those rewards and maybe, you know, uh, you just you know, allotted them somewhere else, gave them to somebody else. And then you get to heaven and that crown that was going to be yours, you no longer receive. You know, the, the crown of life, you no longer get that. The crown of righteousness, you no longer get that. And if you notice, when I read in 2 Timothy 4, Paul, when he's speaking about receiving the crown of righteousness, he says, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give them at that day. He says, and not, and not to me only, but unto all them also that love is appearing. Right before that, you know what the verse right before that says? I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith. And then he says this, henceforth. From now, because I've done that, henceforth there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. He's saying at this point forward, you know, I have this crown. Why? He had to earn that crown, and he'd finished his course at that point, so he had kept those rewards that he was working for. You need to look to yourselves. You need to examine yourselves from time to time and make sure that you're not losing the things that you want. Are you backsliding? Where are you at in your Christian life? Are you doing less than you used to do? Are you reading your Bible less? Are you going soul winning less? Are you, you know, are you doing less good rewards for people and just helping people, whatever it may be? You know, are you doing more today or are you doing less? Have you maybe lost a crown over the past two to three years? Look at this again. Go to Revelation 3. We'll see this a couple of times spoken of, of people losing rewards that they had already earned. Look at Revelation 3.11. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast. Watch what he says, that no man take thy crown. So what, is this, what does this church have at this point in time? They have a crown. And what is he saying? Hold it fast. Look to yourselves. He says that no man take thy crown. So can you lose a crown? Apparently you can, can you? You can have a crown in heaven. You can have rewards in heaven that someone could take from you. Colossians chapter number 2 Verse number 18 says this, let no man beguile you of your, of your reward. And he says, in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, intruding into those things which, which he hath not seen. It goes on and on of something outside of our context right now, our subject. But notice what he said, let no man beguile you of your reward. So you have a reward, but someone could deceive you out of that reward. That's the same concept here in Revelation chapter 3, verse 11. He says, hold that fast which thou hast. That no man take thy crown. It's someone deceiving you. It's someone you know, compelling you. Maybe, maybe even a saved friend that gets you out of church. Maybe an unsaved friend that gets you out of church. Maybe someone setting a bad example for you and sending you down the wrong path. And what did that person do in a sense? They took your crown. They beguiled you out of your reward. That's what they had done. So not only... Do we just do good deeds and receive those rewards? You can, from that point forward, you can you know, uh, uh, diminish in the amount of works that you're doing in your life. Your life can go down a completely different path or a completely different course. And those rewards in heaven that you had, that crown that God was going to give you, he'll no longer give you. There could be a time in your life when you're looking for the, the blessed hope and the glorious appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, right? Where, you're, where you can't wait for Jesus to come. You're just excited about Jesus to come. 
You love his appearing. And what do you get for that? Does anybody remember which crown? Crown of righteousness. Crown of life is for the, those that endure temptation. So you could at that time, God would give you if he came back, you know, it wouldn't be right then because the tribulation has to happen first. But if he came back at the time when you were you know, loving his appearing, you were looking for that blessed hope, right? And couldn't wait for Jesus to come. But what about 10 years after that? What about, you know, the 10 years went by and right before you passed away, you had fallen in love with the things of this world. And you, you weren't really, you didn't care too much. You weren't even, you hadn't thought about Jesus coming back and seeing Jesus and spending time with Jesus in a year, six months, eight months. Do you think he's going to give you that crown? No. He wouldn't, would he? So people will preach sometimes, you'll hear them talk about receiving rewards and getting rewarded in heaven. But you know what they never talk about? How you can lose your rewards if you don't finish your course. How all those rewards that you've earned and God would have given to you, if you don't look to yourselves, you'll lose those things which you have brought. You could be the greatest Christian in the world throughout your early years of life. 20s, 30s, like I said, 40s even. But then you could just go down the wrong path in the end of your life, get to heaven and be the least in the kingdom of heaven. You could be at one point in your life, if you would have died, go, you'd be one of the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. But you could hit something, you know, some, maybe some, something happens in your life that throws you off course. Maybe some hardship, and you weren't able to endure the temptation. You just stop going to church. You know what happens? You get to heaven and just be the least in the kingdom of heaven. You have nothing. God takes away your gold, silver, precious stones. He tries your works by fire, and it's all just wood, hay, and stubble. There's nothing left. You spend eternity with zero rewards. You've got to stand before God and nothing to offer. No works, no nothing. We looked at the primary source of our rewards comes from what? From soul winning. It comes from soul winning. But I'll tell you this. Every time a reward is spoken of, it's always tell, talking about helping another person. Every single time, it talks about how you relate to others in some way. Either getting them saved or benefiting another person spiritually. Listen to this. Spiritually. Philippians chapter number 4, verse number 1, the Bible says this. Therefore, my beloved, therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved, and long for, and then listen to what Paul says, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. So what did Paul refer to as his crown when he was speaking there? Those individual people, he said, was his crown. The works and, and the things that he had done and bestowed on them, right? Everything that he had done for them, he's saying, I'm receiving, this is his point, I'm receiving a crown for, for the things that I've done for you all the works that I've done for you. You know, when you get somebody saved, when you get that person saved, they, in a sense, are your crown, aren't they? In a sense, right? You know, I remember when I, right when I started going so when I was like 22 years old, and I hadn't thought about like being rewarded for things a lot, and I went with my cousin, his name was Ryan, and uh, we went soul winning, we went to this apartment complex, and uh, he was giving the gospel to this guy, this guy ended up getting saved, and we walked out, and uh, he looked over at me, and he was like, He's like, you and me just got a little nugget, golden nugget for our crowns. And that had never crossed my mind. But just like, just me being there, just him giving, you know, the gospel to this guy. Just, just, just getting someone saved. God is a just God. He will reward you for everything that you do. You know, you're not going to get a crown for every person that you get saved when you're walking around with like 700 crowns on your head. But you're going to be rewarded in some sense for each individual person that you get saved. That's what he means when he talks about my crown. The works that I bestow upon you relate directly to the rewards that I receive one day. Everything, every reward that you'll get in heaven is going to be for people that you got to heaven, or it's going to be for you benefiting or expediting someone's spiritual growth. The work that you've invested into a person. That's why it's important to care about people and to love people. You know, to care about the lost and go get them saved, and then to care about the spiritual growth of people in the church. In other words, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2, verse number 19 says this, For what is our hope or joy or crown of rejoicing? And then he says this, Are not even ye in the presence of our Lord Jesus Christ at his coming? So notice that. That his, that his, his uh, you know, joy, he says, and his crown of rejoicing. 
his crown, his rewards, things along those lines. Over and over again, what does he do? He refers to, he refers to the works that he's done today. Them in the presence of the Lord. When they're presented before God, the work that they've bestowed upon these people, that Paul has bestowed upon these people, Paul will be rewarded for it. For, for helping someone and furthering someone's Christianity, right? The, Paul is rewarded for these things. Paul is given crowns for these things for different things that you've done to help others. And it makes perfect sense because you think about this. The Great Commission, right? What's the number one source of our rewards when we look throughout the Bible? Like preaching the gospel. Most important thing, what's the number one thing that Jesus said? Go preach the gospel. And then what does he say? Get them baptized. Then what does he say? Teach them all things. What are all those things to do? Help people get saved. Help people get into church and take their first step. Get them baptized. And you know what else? Teach them. Help them grow. Help them do things. So, you know, the Great Commission, it's basically all of the works that we need to do. Loving your neighbor, if you will. It's the most important works that, that God has left for the church to do. Right? And all of them are things that you should do for other people. If you want to receive a crown, you need to start caring for other people. You need to start caring for the lost souls and getting them saved. You need to start caring that they get into church and get baptized. Compel them. You need to start caring that they further their Christianity. Isn't it sad the people that you got saved last week, two weeks ago, three weeks ago, a month, two months, if you picture someone personally in your mind, isn't it sad that they're sleeping in Sunday morning, yeah. that they're probably you know, in a drunken stupor this morning, laying in some bed, some house that they have no clue where they're at, you know, waking up next to someone that they have no idea where they are, maybe they're in jail this morning with a DUI or something along those lines. Or maybe they lost their job because they're being a drunk or whatever it may be. Isn't that sad that they're not in church today serving God and that you someday, you may be bestowing labors upon other people. You may be going and getting other people saved and doing all these other things and you're going to receive rewards. Isn't that sad that they're not? They're going to get to heaven and have nothing, nothing at all. You know what that should do? That should compel you to go and I don't believe this crap that, oh, just God gets everybody into the church. You know, God just builds the church himself as in, you know, we don't need to invite anybody to church. You don't even need, we don't need to do anything. They'll all come and God will bring them here. It's the, it's the same logical fallacy that other people use when they, uh, you know, when they come to the scriptures, they say, well, God just, God does the saving. Yeah, he does, but you preach the gospel, idiot. You're the one that actually go and you present the gospel. Right. Why even invite someone to church then? Don't even, don't even tell. It's the same because that's isn't that the same argument that they use against them? Well, don't even go preach the gospel. God does the saving, right? Okay. Well, if God builds the church in that sense, then don't even go invite anyone. Right. Don't don't advertise your church at all. Take your sign down. Don't tell anybody about it. God will bring them. God will build the church. Don't worry about it at all. He'll do everything. God's the one that saves people, right? you still need to go preach the gospel. There's a portion that's given to you. Right. Why do you think Paul goes around and says he confirmed the souls? Why does he even write letters to encourage the church and to keep people in church? Why does he even say when somebody leaves the church, you know, and someone it, you know, falls out of church, why does he even tell you to go to restore that brother? Go build a church, brother. If they're supposed to be here, he'll bring them back. That's retarded. Right. No one's going to come to church unless you compel them to. That, that's a fact. Not, people are not going to come here unless what? And why, are you, why would you compel them? Because you care about them. Because you want them to come to church. Think about the people that, you're, that you've given the gospel to over the past month, two months. And think about where they're at this morning. Think about how much better you're doing than they're doing this morning. Think about that for a few minutes. You just, is that okay with you? Or would you rather them come here and you could help them? I want to help the people that I get saved. I don't want to just, you know, you know, get them saved and then, all right, I'll see you in heaven someday. That's sad. That's not what I want. I don't want just the people to, to earn salvation. Are you just happy you're saved and you just want to just go do whatever you want to do? No. So should you want the same thing for others that you want for yourself if you're not a selfish person? Yeah, of course. Don't you want to have rewards in heaven? You should want them to have rewards in heaven, too. You know, uh, Paul writes, and he talks about uh, how 
He's like, I, you know, I'm asking for something. He needed, he needed something. I can't remember what church it was in particular. But he's requesting, you know, he needed something. I think it's the only time that Paul ever asked for, like, goods or anything to help himself, right? And he says, he says, I don't ask, you know, so that I can benefit from it. But he says, he's like, I ask for it so that fruit may abound to your account. Think about that attitude. He's like, it's, you know, he's like, I mean, and he's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He's saying that I'm not even asking because I want it or need it, really. He's like, maybe, he, well, think about this. What if he didn't even need it? He's like, hey, send me this. And then he takes the money or whatever it is and gives it to somebody else. But the only reason why he requested for them to send it to him was so that they could receive rewards. Think about that. He said, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, I'm not asking it for it for myself. I'm asking for this, for you to send this to me or give this to me so that fruit may abound to your account, so that you can receive rewards when you get to heaven. That's the reason why I'm asking you. I believe that. You believe the Bible? You believe Paul's telling the truth? Then, that, then the reason why he asked for that was so that they could receive a reward. Start looking after others. Start caring about others. Start, you know, caring about the people you get saved. You don't want to, you know, just walk away from some house. People are living in the ghetto. They, they know nothing, you know, about the Bible or how they should be living their lives. They don't even know the commandments that can, that can help them to be blessed and to live a good life. You just walk away and, yeah, at least they're going to heaven. That's not all that's there. Why don't you just have that attitude about yourself then? Start caring about the people that you get saved. Start caring about the people that you give the gospel to and desire for them to get baptized. Desire for them to start changing their lives. Amen. Grow this burden in your heart where you, you care just as much about them earning rewards as you do yourself. Care about people. Have a heart for people where you want them to come to church and to change their lives. Amen. You know, that's what you need to have an attitude where you're selfless, where you, where you want other people to do, do well just like you want yourself to do. You know, you know why people don't go soul winning in the first place? Because they're selfish. Right. Because right. they don't they don't care whether the world's going to hell. They're right. just, I'm going to heaven. You know why people don't spend time trying to get people in church? Because they're selfish. That's right. You may you may not be selfish in one area, but that doesn't mean you're not selfish in another area. Amen. That oh, I'm just not a selfish person. I go out and preach the gospel to people. Okay, what else do you do for them? Is that all that we should do for them? You're supposed to teach them all things whatsoever I have commanded you, Jesus said. Are you doing that? Are you trying to get them in church? Are you trying to help their family? All these people that you give them the gospel and they have a broken family. They may get a divorce in five years. Why? Because they don't know how to live their life. And the recipes in the, in, right in the Bible, they can come to church and learn that. And then their, their family remains intact because you compelled them to come to church. Think about that. I am positive that there are thousands, if not millions, of relationships that have been saved because one person went and preached the gospel and got them saved, got them to come to church, and then their, their marriage was transformed by the counsel of the scriptures. Good. I'm positive of that. A hundred million, that there are at least thousands, if not millions, thousands of marriages that have been changed. And you know the guy that went to their door and got them saved and then compelled them to come into church? He is responsible for, for uh, you know, uh, keeping that marriage together. He's the one that did it. Wouldn't you like to do that for somebody? Wouldn't you like to go out there and, and, and you be the one that actually kept that family intact? That actually kept that family together? What a beautiful thing when, when people start coming to church and you just see their lives transformed. You start talking to them and all of a sudden they're talking about the Bible. And they've never talked about the Bible. They start coming to church for two to three months, and all of a sudden they're interested in the Bible. They're saying things that you know. I mean, you've been reading your Bible. You're, getting in, you're listening when we're in church. I want to see people's lives transformed. I want, I want to build this church, but it's, it, it's not just selfish reasons. You know, I want, I want to build the church so we can do more work for God, but I want to help people. I want to impact Jacksonville in order to get people saved. But I want to transform people's <laughs> lives. And I want to have many people that just the direction of their life is just totally changed. And they just become a soldier for Christ. Where they're just sold out and all they want to do is just serve God. And they care just about the Bible, much about the Bible as you do. But it's because of your influence. They care just as much about earning rewards now in heaven. And they're not just, you know, just concerned about this life as you do. 
because of your influence on their life. So you know what's going to compel you to, to, to give rewards? Because number one, you sh I don't know how anybody wouldn't have an incentive to, how the incentive of rewards in heaven doesn't compel them in the first place. But you want to know one of the other things that's going to compel you to earn rewards if the reward itself doesn't compel you? It's going to be the care of people. Some, some people may not even care about the rewards, but they care about people. And you know what? They get rewarded anyways. You need to be striving for rewards because the Bible tells you to. It's actually the wrong attitude to say, oh, you know, you shouldn't be doing it for rewards. Paul said, run so that you may obtain. Right. That's right. It's a good thing to, to want to earn rewards. It's a bad thing if you just don't care what Jesus thinks about you and you don't care when he comes back that he's going to reward you according as your works have, have been. That's, it's, it, you know, if you stand before Jesus with wood, hay, and stubble, you're going to be ashamed. All right. Maybe that will compel you to start wanting to work for God and to earn some rewards. But you know what? You need to care about people. Amen. You need to care about the people that we preach the gospel to. You need to care about getting people saved. But don't just walk away from them. Just see you later. Take the follow-up program seriously. Amen. Care about the follow-up program. Get the people's numbers. Care about reaching back out to them and getting them into church. When you call them, don't be phony and pretentious. Care about them actually coming to church. Develop the burdens. Speak to them in such a manner because they can tell whether you really care or not. Speak to them and let them know you care about them and that you want them to come to church. I'll end with this, because it was basically a two-parter. If you live a disobedient life as a Christian, you're going to be cursed. God you know, talks about you being cursed when you come in, cursed when you go out. He's going to punish you. You are going to make your life miserable on earth. But you know what? God is a just, caring God. Because if you're an obedient Christian, guess what? You'll be blessed when you go in. You'll be blessed when you go out. He'll reward you with good things. He'll give you crowns in heaven that he prepared for you. He'll give you all types of, of different rewards and different things because he loves you and cares about you is the reason why he'll be rewarded. He doesn't have to give you crap. Right. He doesn't have to give you anything. But he loves you and cares about you. You know what? You need to love and care about other people and, get them, and, and try to compel them to run that race as well and to, obtain, to want to obtain a crown. Care about others. That's what's going to come. That's another point of compelling you to earn rewards. It's power has to have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father God, we thank you, dear Lord God, for, for just being a great example for us, dear Lord, of being compassionate, caring for others, of, uh, of course, finishing your race like no one else could have, God, and doing uh, the job that no one else could have done. We thank you for everything you've done for us. Just be with us and bless us, dear Lord. Uh, help the church to grow. Give us the wisdom and the resources and the, the burden to get the church to grow. Uh, we love you and just help us to, to have a burning, passionate desire and zeal uh, to, to run the race and to fight the fight, dear Lord. Just be with us and bless us. And in Jesus Christ's name, amen.